So I would like to turn now from uh, looking at the effect of sample size on power and so on to linking design and approach to analysis. Now, before I start on part two, I should say that what I'm talking about here will be quite new to you. It's also some topics which are covered in considerable detail in later units, particularly PSY248. So all I want you to get from this lecture is the essential concepts that we need to think about consequences for our analysis based on some design considerations from our study. I don't expect you to have a deep understanding nor to understand a lot of detail. So let's say I conduct one study and I conduct one t-test and another research group conducts a second study and they conduct the one t-test then that's fine. We've both conducted our analyses as usual and that's quite appropriate. And I mentioned earlier that if we conduct uh, enough studies and obtain enough independent samples, we could even forget formal analysis just by um, counting the results across uh, studies. We might find that uh, 99 out of 100 studies come to the same conclusion regarding CBT versus placebo or correlation between two constructs or whatever the problem might be. But that's not normally how research in psychology is conducted, or at least not always. It's actually quite common in some areas such as social psychology to measure a number of dependent variables in the one sample and to conduct analyses on all of those DVs. And if we do that, then we need to consider the consequences for our hypothesis testing. Now, why is that, you ask? Well, it's because the idea of uh, independent samples versus type 1 error. If I conduct uh, one analysis on one sample, that's fine. But I know that as I, if, as I conduct more and more analyses or test more and more hypotheses, that my type 1 error is going to accumulate. And if I conduct enough hypothesis tests, at some point I will almost certainly make a type 1 error but of course, I won't know which sample or which hypothesis test uh, is the type 1 error and which one isn't. And we know that we denote the probability of making a type 1 error by the Greek letter alpha. So an important consideration in hypothesis testing is to minimize alpha, to minimize that probability of making a type 1 error. And sometimes we do that by putting a cap on what we will allow alpha to be. So turning the story around for a moment, when can we validly interpret p-values? Well, the conditions uh, are essentially uh, when the assumptions of the hypothesis test are met, such as normal distribution, equal variances, and so on. But also when the hypothesis that we are testing has some valid theoretical basis. So conducting an hypothesis test uh, which has no particular theoretical or empirical background may yield a, a nonsensical result, may yield a statistical, uh, the significant finding, but nonetheless be a type 1 error because it's not well grounded in theory. But the important uh, requirement for uh, right now is it's we can validly interpret the p-values at face value when we conduct just one hypothesis test on a given sample. It's actually an implicit assumption in the basis from which the tail values that we saw earlier are calculated is that, that, is that the hypothesis test that we are interpreting is the only hypothesis test conducted on that sample. And if we actually do conduct more than one hypothesis test because we have more than one dv, this basis is not met. So I said earlier that the, what we try to do is to get around this problem by um, actively setting a cap on the maximum probability that we will accept of type 1 error. And how do we do that, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I will tell you. And the answer is uh, this, essentially, that we decide on what DVs we're going to analyze and therefore what hypothesis tests we're going to conduct. We determine what alpha is and 
what power, what statistical power we want to achieve. And from that, we decide on our approach to the analysis. So let's suppose that we decide that we will analyze the three dependent variables. We'll therefore set alpha as the, as the uh, nominal alpha of 0.05 divided by three. Um, and that will s tell us that our definition of significance is not p less than 0.05, but p less than 0.0167. So what have we done? Well, we've adjusted our definition of what significant means from 0.05 to 0.05 divided by three. And that is literally to accommodate this testing multiple hypotheses on one sample. And this is known as the Bonferroni approach. Um, what Bonferroni approach assumes is that the probability of making a type one error increases by alpha, say 0.05, with every test which we performed. Perform. So that assumes that there is a linear increase in the total probability of type one error across all these tests. So we know that this uh, approach is quite conservative, that the total probability of making a type one error across all the tests we conduct is probably not as large as alpha multiplied by the number of tests performed, but it is a very widely used approach uh, for a small number of tests like two or three or four. It's probably not terribly conservative and it is, of course, very easy to implement. So I would like to turn now to a practical example to make these principles more concrete. Let's suppose we are conducting a study whose research question, whose motivating research question, is whether CBT reduces anxiety, depression, pain catastrophizing, and self-reported gastrointestinal symptoms in clients who've been referred to a psychology clinic by their general practitioner. So these are individuals who have had some pain, some comorbid anxiety and depression. They've gone to their GP who cannot find any organic cause and has therefore thought they might benefit from a course of CBT designed to uh, reduce this package of, of issues. We're going to conduct a, a two-group randomized controlled trial with dependent variables, the Spielberger anxiety and depression scores, the pain catastrophizing scale, and uh, symptoms reported through the gastrointestinal symptom rating scale, or the GSRS. Our independent variable is CBT group, which might be active versus placebo or sham therapy, and individuals are allocated to those two groups randomly. We decide that we will conduct our hypothesis test uh, as the independent or two groups t-tests. So we turn then to defining statistical significance. And our aim is that across all the four hypothesis tests which we conduct, we want to constrain the total probability of making a type one error to be no greater than 0.05. To achieve this, we're going to apply the Bonferroni approach and set alpha or the p-value below which we define statistical significance to be 0 0.0125 for each of the four t-tests which involve one of the given dvs. What this means is that across these four tests, according to the Bonferroni principle, the total probability of making a type 1 error will be 4, the number of tests, multiplied 0.0125, which is the maximum type 1 error probability in each of these tests. And of course, 4 times 0.0125 is equal to 0.05. And of course, we came to the 0.0125 by taking the total probability across all the tests we're conducting, which we're prepared to accept, which was the 0.05, and dividing that by four, which is the number of tests we're going to conduct. And this brings us to our test-wise, um, or per test, alpha of 0.0125. And here is the results of our tests. In the top left, we have the t-test for anxiety, top right depression, 
bottom left catastrophizing and bottom right the GSRS. And these four tests yield p-values of about 0 0.027, 0 0.45, 0 0.12, 0.12 and 0.11. So if we had ignore, uh, ignored the four tests we're conducting and just assume all was well, we would reject H0 for anxiety and have concluded that the anxiety scores in the CBT group are higher than those in the placebo group. But in the Bonferroni approach, we will accept H0 even for this one case because the p-value of 0.0267 is greater than the 0.0125, which we define to be the significance level required per test. So our conclusion here was that we might have been making a type 1 error by rejecting the null hypothesis for anxiety, because it falls in that zone between the 0.05 and the 0.0125. The general principle here is that as soon as we are conducting uh, multiple tests, we need to do something about alpha. And it's that funny trade-off of trying to be efficient in our research. And that is not a bad thing in itself, uh, because to have conducted four separate studies for anxiety, depression, catastrophizing, and gastrointestinal symptoms would have been quite inefficient, quite expensive, quite wasteful of public resources, perhaps. And so conducting these four hypothesis tests in one study rather than four is indeed, in terms of resource usage, quite an efficient thing to do. But it does come with its own price, and that is the increased probability of making a type 1 error. And so our do something in this case is to counteract the risk by making it tougher to reject H0 in any particular hypothesis test. And we do that because uh, doing multiple tests in the one sample goes against that uh, probability basis of the hypothesis tests. So what have we learned from all this? Well, we know that the interpretation of the hypothesis test depends upon the effect size that we, we need to uh, take into account in our interpretation, whether the effect size is large enough to have some scientific or maybe clinical significance. Because if it doesn't, then making a conclusion about the efficacy of treatment or the correlation between construct, constructs might be a logical fallacy. It depends upon the predefined level of significance that we're going to use, the study design, and of course the assumptions being met.